Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. You know what? I've been thinking all day just how faithful He's been. No matter the, the clouds that come over us, the darkness, it just seems like it presses down. There's always light in every situation. Christ is in every situation, church. And I'm so glad. I am so thankful that He walks with us. What a, what a word this morning. Through the valley. Through the valley. Even in the wilderness, he feeds us. Glory, glory, glory. I have been just meditating and thinking on that word today. And I'm, just, I'm telling you, it's been in my spirit. He is so good to us, church. So worthy of the praise and the glory and the honor and the worship. Everything we have belongs to Him. I love Him, church. Let's remember in prayer Jody Young, Ron and Ann Wittenberg, Kelly Evans, Pamela Vick, Dale Ennis, Billy Crabtree, John Barton, Pam Gurley, Mike Bailey, Linda Reed's great-grandson Miller, Mary Mitchell, Lenny Potts, Becky Smith and family, Lacey Harrison, Brother James Nichols, Ali Ramos, and, and pray for Sister Patricia Barton. She's having total knee replacement on April 24th. And we've been set up at, down at the fairgrounds for our business. And I'll, and I'll make it short, but I need y'all to pray, pray with me and believe with me. And we sit up down there and we've done terrible. And I'm thinking, Lord, what is going on here? And so I thought, you know, maybe we should move sides, move somewhere else. Well, I called the people and they said, yeah, you can move. Find a place, move, make it fast. But it felt like in my spirit, no, I don't want you to move. And I'm thinking, well, I need to make money. He said, don't I supply everything? I want you to stay right there where you are. Sometimes we're like Jonah. A little while later, I'm like, now this is aggravating. He said, stay there. And I said, well, God, I need you to show me why I'm here then, please. I need that. Because the other part of me is wanting to complain, but yet I want to believe you. Can you show me? A little while later, this person sat up beside us. He has a foreign accent. Uh, the stuff he's selling, I don't want my kids around. And I'm thinking, where am I at? What am I doing here? 
Well, he started being friendly, talking to me. We started carrying on conversations the last two nights. We've worked 30 hours in the last two days there at the fair, so we've spent a lot of time beside each other. And I asked him, I said, well, do you want one of our drinks? I'll give it to you for free. He said, no. He said, maybe Tuesday I'm fasting. I said, okay. I said, why are you fasting? He said, it's Ramadan, I'm Muslim. I said, okay, God, I understand why I'm here. My intentions of coming was not God's intentions. So I need y'all to pray. Pray, pray that God would give me a door. Give me an opportunity to witness to him. I've already spoke a little of Christ, but I need that door to open because every soul matters to him. And I want to take advantage of this opportunity, so I need your prayer. Well, let's pray together for these on this list and believe God. This list needs to be gone because he's the healer. He is the healer. And I want to hear testimonies of the healing power of the blood of Jesus Christ on these right here. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you. We love you. And I thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your word. I pray, God, that you would touch the bodies of these people, that their bodies would line up with your word. Your word goes forth and it heals. There is healing power in your word. And in the name of Jesus, Father, we pray for healing upon these people. And I pray, God, right now, as he's out there in the fair, that you would bring conviction. I ask, Father, that you would open a door that Christ could come in. I pray, God, that you would knock down walls. And I pray that you would fill this atmosphere with your presence. I pray that you would anoint the man of God as he preaches. And I ask, Father, for liberty and peace and joy in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. If the ushers would come forward. Hallelujah to the Lamb. You know, we hear of his coming so much, but I'm telling you, it's so close. Even at the door. There are so many signs, not only on earth, but in heaven, not only with Israel. So I don't want to push it to the side and say we've heard it all our life. My children asked me the other day, they said, Daddy, am I not going to be able to be a teenager? I said, I don't know, but be ready. Be ready, church. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Father, I thank you for your faithfulness in everything that you've given to us individually, our families, our health, our finances, our salvation, this wonderful church, this body of believers. And I ask, Father, that you would bless this offering to the furthering of your kingdom that souls will be one. In Jesus' name, amen. Most of 
son in the service with us and I told him I said uh, why don't you sing for us tonight and um, you need the piano player back in here oh he's not very round but he's back there somewhere can y'all hear me back there? Okay. <laughs> Let me tell you a little something. Let me reminisce here a little bit. Can I do that? That's what old people do. You know, they tell old stories. Tell the same ones over and over and over. I gave advice to a young pastor that was our youth pastor, and he took a church that had mostly older people in it, and he said, how do I pastor it? I said, well, I was 18 years old, and I pastored a bunch of old people, and I, I'll tell you what to do. They're going to tell you the same stories every time you go see them, but you laugh like you never heard it before, and you make them feel good. And if you keep those old people happy, you can go out and build a church and get young people in, but keep those old people happy. Listen to their stories again and again. Amen. So there was a time when uh, we started Northside back in 1975, and uh, Mike was my first youth pastor, and then he was my first 
associate pastor and he was secretary. I gave him the assignment of taking care of all the people that came by and wanted help and all of those stories that they would tell. And uh, he good, did a good job. He and his wife, Kathy, were a part of the worship team. In fact, back in the, uh, I think probably the late 80s, Mike Huckabee was pastor of Beach Street Baptist Church downtown. And uh, Mike called me one day and he said, uh, we're having a Billy Graham satellite feed crusade in our church and uh, uh, we would like for your worship team to come down and do a 30 minute time of worship and uh, you emcee it and, and so the only worship team we had at that point were three and that was Mike and his wife Kathy and Joyce and so we went down to the Beach Street First Baptist Church and did their praise and worship in the 30 minutes prior to the Billy Graham uh, satellite feed. And uh, then uh, going way back, are y'all still listening? Have I bored you yet? Going way back in the early 70s, uh, we, uh, well, back before that in the 60s, we pastored over on the hill. You've heard me talk about the hill. That's where Mary Teller and Mary Posey, and uh, they, were, they were a part of the church then. In fact, Mike grew up with, uh, with Mary Posey's uh, two sons, Ronnie and Tim. And they were about the same age. They were Royal Rangers back in those days. And uh, they kept the Royal Ranger leader very humble. And uh, so in the early 70s, we left and started traveling as an evangelistic team. And uh, I sang one or two songs just to kind of make it look like a trio. And, uh, but Mike and, um, and Joyce were the singers. And I, our son that passed away about six years ago, Brian, nine years younger than Mike, and he was our drummer, and he got all the attention. He was a good drummer at five years old, and we traveled and did crusades, 10-night crusades, started on Wednesday night, and we would go through uh, two Sundays, and sometimes we would go through four Sundays and just stay there and have a Holy Ghost meeting, but uh, they would sing, and uh, Mike was the uh, t uh, tech engineer, and he was the media director, and he was the one that unloaded all of the equipment and set it up and did all of that. So anyhow, he's still alive in spite of it all. And so he's been a blessing to us and it's a blessing to have him here tonight. And I'm just going to let him go here and turn him loose and uh, let him do what he wants to do. Amen. He has been pastor. He has been uh, uh, a little bit everything. And so we're glad that he's here tonight all the way from Houston, drove in this afternoon, so uh, he's probably weary, but nonetheless, I told him, I want you to see, and he's an obedient son. He is an obedient son. He did it. <laughs> Amen. Love you, bud. To the gentleman that was up here talking about not knowing why he didn't move his little uh, business at the fair. I can tell you that I pastored churches. I've been associate pastor of churches. I've been over at uh, First Assembly um, with Hal Halton way back. Worked with musicians and music. I've been in uh, construction. I'm in work for an engineering company now. I do new home construction. Been doing that because of a guy that I prayed for in my parking lot one night on a Wednesday night. Went out and prayed. We were dedicating a bus that was given to us. And uh, he come up with his family. He said, I'm thinking about quitting my job and taking pastor of this little church down here. And I looked over and saw his three kids. And I said this to Clayton Morris. I said, don't quit your day job. <laughs> and he looked at me real fast. I said, you can do that on the weekend, but don't quit your day job. Six months later, the company sold. And it has sold six more times since then. The last time, a little over $100 million. First time it sold for $8 million. And when it sold the first time, the old gentleman that had taught him made him a shareholder. So every time he sold shares, he has seven kids now. <laughs> but he's the one that brought me into that business and said, I want to bless you because pastoring a small church, training people to be five-fold ministry, 
pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, and apostles. And they forget about everything but pastors and evangelists anymore. But there's prophets and apostles that need to be taught what's going on in their life when they have that anointing. Some people can get up and prophesy and say some pretty tough things that the rest of us can't do unless we're really anointed with the Holy Spirit. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? We need apostles. And a gentleman one time called me aside years ago, said, you're an apostle. And I just said, don't. He said, but don't ever put that in front of your name. I said, thank you. Because I don't like, I, I didn't care for that. But he said, you're going to touch the lives of pastors, teachers, prophets, and apostles, evangelists. He said, you're going to touch all five of them. The thumb is the apostle that touches those other four ministries. And ever since then, God has blessed me with people in my past, some that had quit the ministry, that I was able to tell them, get back in the ministry. Hispanics that are out here building and putting these houses together for us, that cannot speak English, but they know the Holy Spirit. And when I pray in the Holy Spirit, they know what's going on. And I have prayed for more people outside the church since my last pastorate. And the first one was in one month, a Christmas tree tent. I told my wife I was going to go down at the last minute, 10 o'clock, they close at 11. And at 12 o'clock, I was still praying for the 18th person in that tent because one lady chicken out at the cashier said, I do this for my missions money to go to Mexico. She said, pray for this one. And then the couple fixing the payout said, will you pray for us? And then I prayed for every roughneck boy in there that was from drugs to alcohol, loading them trees up every night. Prayed for every one of them. And then the owner of all of them all over Houston was in that tent that night. She said, you need to pray for him. And I prayed for him. So never underestimate where God will lead you if you just say, God, this is your day. Somewhere today, whatever I say is going to bless somebody. And if you look for that opportunity, God will bring people into your life that you'll be able to pray for. Because most people, when they tell me, oh, it's okay, I said, what's going on? Well, this, that, and the other. I said, do you mind if I pray with you? Most people don't mind it. When you pray with them, that's when they connect. People that don't, don't even believe, I said, you don't have to believe. I said, can I pray with you that God would make himself real to you? And nobody's ever turned me down. But I've had testimony of people that went home and said, you know what? I've never felt God's presence before. But when I walked away from that, I said, God, I feel something. If you're real, let me know. I want to tell you something. Don't ever underestimate the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that lives in you because it's the same one that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the same one that's got him at the right hand of the Father praying for you and me that we will ever intercede and pray and believe that whatever happened in Jesus' life happens in our life. This is what causes it to happen. You ready? No practice. Ready? Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about my troubles.
But Jesus is a friend who wants you day and night. You just go to him in prayer. He knows your every care. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Sing it with me. Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about my troubles. He will hear my faintest cry. He will answer. That's the first time I've seen in probably 15 years. That's like not working out with weights, you know it? Your chest starts hurting. <laughs> God bless you. Hallelujah. That's where I learned to sing. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Thank you, Mike, for doing that for me. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you ready? Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 14 and verses 28 and 29 tonight. And I'm going to talk about faith and action. All right. Let's read it together. One, two, three. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your blessing on the word tonight. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Faith needs certain actions. I know I talk a lot about faith, but there's a lot to learn about faith. And I'm trying to learn about faith. I'm trying to learn to live by faith. And there's a whole lot that I don't know. But there's a whole lot that I do know that I used to didn't know. That was a deep subject there. I can tell by your no response that it was so deep you didn't really get it. Hallelujah. But you know, faith, faith always wants to do what Jesus did. And when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water, he wanted to do what Jesus was doing. And that's what faith ought to cause every one of us to do is to desire to do what Jesus is doing. For Jesus said, the works that I do, you shall do also. So he's told us that we could do that. So whatever Jesus does, we want to do it. Whatever Jesus says, we want to say it. We want to do what Jesus does. But there is action that has to accompany our faith. Faith is not words alone. Faith is not a profession alone. Faith is not a mentality attitude alone. Faith has action and faith needs action for it to manifest itself in our life. So action is a process 
that involves more than just taking a step. It is a continuous walk. Peter took that step, and we'll talk about what happened, but it's more than just taking a step. It is a continuous walk. Colossians 1 and 10 says that you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Faith needs that kind of action in order to work. In other words, you need to walk and be acceptable and pleasing to God. And then that word increase here, that you need to increase in knowledge. Faith needs you to increase your knowledge because faith comes by hearing the knowledge of the word of God. And so we have to increase our knowledge in order for our faith to grow. Now then, let's talk about the first action. Faith needs the action of inspiration. Inspiration or desire because when Peter said, Lord, bid me to come to you, that was his desire. But in order for him to have the inspiration for that desire to be fulfilled, he had to hear a response from Jesus. And the inspiration came when Jesus said, come. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But desire is the force of your feelings. The more you desire something, the more forceful your feelings are. The more you desire something, the more forceful your emotions are. You desire something. You just can't wait. You desire something. You try to figure out how you can fulfill that desire. And so desire is a part of the motivation of everything that we do. And so when we come to desire, we need to consider the fact that it is a powerful force in our life. Now the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and uh, verse 11, 7, 11, it tells us this. Paul is complimenting these Corinthian Christians with a list, a long list of things that he is complimenting them because they have done certain things. And one of the things that he compliments them for is found in these words. He said what vehement desire. What vehement desire. And that word vehement means this. It means an extreme, powerful, intense emotion. And when Paul said, I commend you that you have a desire that is strong, a desire that is powerful, a desire that is intense, and your emotions are affected by your desire. Well, of course, they had a desire for God. They had a desire for the things of God. And, and our faith needs that kind of desire. If you don't have the desire for God and the things of God, then your faith is not gonna function properly. The Bible tells us in Psalm 27 and verse four, the psalmist said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after all the days of my life 
that I may spend my life, spend my days in the house of the Lord so that I could behold the beauty of the Lord and so that I can inquire at his holy temple. But David had a desire to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life because he wanted to see the beauty of the Lord and he wanted to pray prayers as he inquired at his holy temple. David had desire. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 1, desire spiritual gifts. Are you desiring spiritual gifts? And this is in the context of the nine gifts of the Spirit, the nine supernatural gifts of the Spirit. How much time have you spent seeking those desires? The command is to desire spiritual gifts. You'll never have them unless you desire them. And we are to desire supernatural, spiritual gifts. We are to seek for them and we're to qualify for the Holy Spirit to work in our lives and manifest his power through us. Desire. And for your faith to function in the gifts of the Spirit, you have to have the action of desire. The scripture goes on to tell us in Mark 11 in verse 24, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So desire has to be a part of our prayer of faith. If you don't have that vehement desire, if you don't have that, then your faith is not gonna function well because your faith needs the action of desire. It needs that inspiration within you and you must long for it. You must want it. The Bible says to thirst for it. The Bible says to hunger for it. And hunger and thirst means that there is a painful sensation that you're experiencing because you're hungry or you're thirsty and whenever we feel pain, wanting something so bad it hurts, then I'm, cons I'm, I'm convinced that you're gonna get it but until we want it, until it hurts. When you're hurting with hunger, you're gonna find food. When your throat is so dry because of thirst, you're gonna find something to drink and you're not gonna taste the pH value of it. Are you hearing me? Faith needs the action of the inspiration of desire. Then Psalm 37 and 4 says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. God wants to give you the desires of your heart. And we understand the desires of our heart have to be according to his will. Now then, the second thing, Faith needs the action of aspiration. Inspiration is the desire that comes and is expressed. Aspiration is that which activates the desire. Aspiration is an action that activates your desire. You can have a desire and not do anything about it. You can have a desire and there's no activity that's motivated by that desire. Now let me take these two words and I, I try not to get into this but I, I can't do it, I guess it's me. So you have to put up with me. We talked about the action of inspiration and now we're talking about the action of aspiration. Two things here. Inspiration, inspiration is what the Lord does in expressing his will. 
Inspiration comes from the expressed will of God. Aspiration is what we do to activate our will. Inspiration, his will. Aspiration, our will. Keep that in mind. Now then, Peter had a desire. And he said, I want to walk on the water from this boat all the way to where you are. Now then, he had no right. He had no basis to have faith for that. Because nowhere in the word of God does it promise that you can ask God and you'll get to walk on water. So before we can claim a promise, there has to be a promise. Before we can claim the word of God, it has to be spoken or revealed to us. And so when Jesus responded to the desire that Peter had, when Jesus said, come, that became the word of the Lord. There's two ways that we understand the will of God. We understand the will of God by searching the word of God and the word of God is the will of God. And so whenever we search the will of God, understand the will of God, then from understanding the will of God comes the faith and the power to do the will of God. You understand that? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when you receive the word of God, you receive faith. And when you receive faith, the promise of the word of God comes with power to accomplish whatever that promise said it would do for you. Because the scripture says in 2 Timothy Chapter 3 and verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that means God breathed. And Jesus said that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So out of the mouth of Jesus came his will for Peter. Come. Now then, we read the Word of God, and what we read in the Word of God is the will of God for everybody. But when it comes to B.J. Smith preaching the gospel, that's a personal revelation of God's will for me. So there is the general revelation of his will that comes through the Word of God, and that's for everybody. But then every individual will have a revealed will. One's the written word of God, that's for everybody. But there is a revealed will that God gives to me in calling me to preach. And when he called me to preach, that was his revealed word. That was his revealed will. And when I received his revealed will, then I received the power and I received the, the faith in order to fulfill what he had called me to do. Do you understand that? If he's called you to teach a, a Sunday school class, along with that call comes the power and the ability and the anointing to do it. And unless you're called, you don't have the anointing. The personal Revelation of God's will to us individually. Nobody else on that boat could expect to step out of that boat and walk on water. Only Peter. Because the revealed will of God was a personal revelation to Peter. And it didn't apply to anybody else. But the written word of God applies to everybody. But God has a personal place and a personal plan for every one of us. He has a personal call to do something. And when he calls you to do it, Sister Stephanie, when God calls you to be the administrator of this Christian school, 
along with that call, he gives you a faith. He gives you a power. He gives you an anointing to do that job. He didn't give it to me. He didn't give it to others, but he gave it to you. And along with that power, you walk on water. Whatever it takes in order to fulfill the call of God, God has given a personal revelation to every one of us. And if he says, come, we can come. Woo. Are you with me? We teach the word of God is for everybody. When it says don't steal, that means everybody. But when it says, <laughs> I'm not going to get into that. That's what makes me long-winded. So, even as the word of God that we read together and obey, everybody obeys the same. It is by inspiration of God, it is the very breath of God. But when God gives to me the revealed revelation of his will for my personal life, it is still his breath because it comes out of his mouth. And when God speaks, you can't speak without breathing. And when the word of the Lord comes to you and calls you into a personal ministry, he's breathing life into your ministry. It'll not be a dead ministry because it has the breath of God in it. It has the power of God in it. It has the faith of God. You see, when you read the word of God, faith comes, and that's called the fruit of faith. But whenever there's a revealed will of God, the gift of faith comes. And there's a gift difference in the gift of faith and the fruit of faith. But the gift of faith always accompanies the personal call of God. God gives to you a faith that is sufficient to fulfill your personal call. And it's time for you to open up your hearts and understand what God has called you to do. It's not what this church votes you into doing. It's what God calls you to do. It's not what the pastor asks you to do. It's what God calls you in to do. It's good that you're willing to do whatever you want to do, but if you're not called to do what you've been asked to do and you try to do it, you're going to get tired, you're going to get weary, you're going to get disgusted, and you're going to affect your own spiritual life. But hear the voice of God. My sheep know my voice. They hear my voice. The personal, revealed will of God that calls us. Where'd that come from? Mike took up my time, so. <laughs> That's inspiration. That's desire. But aspiration has to do with our will. Now, you don't live for God by your willpower. You live for God by his willpower. And what aspiration of your will does is that it activates your will to surrender to the will of God. Now, you still have to will it, but you're not going to live in your willpower. You cannot go out and conquer sin in your own natural willpower. But whenever you yield your will to his will, then his will rules your will and you activate your will under the auspices of his will and you will go out and you will overcome the devil and the world and the flesh. Amen. Faith needs action. Matthew 6, verse 21. The woman who had the issue of blood, a bleeding problem, 
says that she said in her heart, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be whole. It's her desire. But her will, her will was determined to touch the hem of his garment. You see, and, and, and I, don't, I don't know how to say everything I need to say. There's so much to be said. I know that we don't live in our natural strength. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You living and him living is so closely connected, it's difficult to know if you're living or he's living, but the fact is he is living in you and through you and using every faculty you have to fulfill his will in your life and through your life, you become one with him and you can't know the difference. When your will is surrendered to him, you will to press through the crowd and touch the hem of his garment. She wasn't trusting herself, but she was using her will to yield to the will of Jesus. And when she touched him, the will of Jesus flowed into her body and healed her. Are you with me? In Mark chapter 9 in verse 23, the man with the son or the child, the son, that was tormented with the devil and the demon would take him and throw him in the fire. And you know the devil, the, the, the disciples tried to cast him out and couldn't. Jesus comes down and the man, the father, comes to Jesus and in verse 23 says, if you can do anything, then say, my son, deliver my son. And Jesus responded and put the buck back on him. He said, it's not a question of whether or not I can do anything. But he said, if you, you, you have to exercise your will. You have to be willing to believe me. And he said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. So what I'm saying is that aspiration activates our own will by surrendering our will to his will, but it still comes back whosoever will can be saved. And we have something to do. But our will is surrendered to his will. And I'm going to quit saying that. I keep saying it because I think you're not uh, understanding me. But if you shout out and say, I understand, I'll go on. Uh, that's good enough. So faith needs inspiration from his will. Faith needs aspiration from our will, and then faith needs initiation. Take the first step. You're going to have to step out, move out, and when Peter said, bid me to come, he couldn't come until he had the will of God, but when Jesus said, come, He came down out of the ship and walked on the water going toward Jesus. I believe with all my heart that when Peter received that word, that will that says, come, it's my will for you to come and walk to me on the water. That's my will. I believe Peter had sufficient faith to walk all the way to Jesus. 
He stepped out into the water. And after a step or two, he started sinking. And he said, Lord, save me. And Jesus took him by the hand and saved him, put him back in the boat. Now there's another sermon. There's so much to say that even when we fail in our faith, he still helps us. God's mercy is, is so great we cannot comprehend it with our minds. We embarrass him. He still loves us. Oh, yeah, he's merciful, and we don't want to abuse that. And in his mercy, he reaches down and he saves Peter. But whenever he picked Peter up out of the water, put him back in the boat, he said to Peter, in the verses that followed the ones we read, he said, oh, ye of little faith, I've often said, little faith is enough to get you out of the boat, but it'll drown you. And Jesus said, how is it, or uh, how is it that you doubt? Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And the Bible says that when Peter started walking on the water, when he saw the boisterous wind which was causing the waves to be high, when he saw the waves, he was afraid. Up to that point, he had enough faith to make it. Listen to me. Your faith will become little when your fears become big. Don't forget that. God put it in my heart and I'm gonna keep it myself. You can have good faith. You can have sufficient faith. But whenever you start looking at the at the natural or at the storm and you become fearful, when your fear becomes big, your faith will become little. And he got little faith because he was afraid of the circumstances that he was actually walking on top of. You've got to keep your eyes upon Jesus. You've got to keep looking to Jesus. You can't look at the waves. You can't look at the storm. You can't look at the adversary. You can't look at the persecution. You can't look at the circumstances. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. Look to him. Look to him. In Hebrews 12 and verse 2, says, looking unto Jesus, the offer and finisher of our faith. <laughs> Jesus is the offer of your faith. He is the perfecter of your faith, and he is the finisher of your faith. Jesus never gives you enough faith to start and leave you on your own. When he gives you starting faith, he gives you finishing faith. Because he is the offer, he's the finisher, he is the beginning, he is the end, and he gives you everything in between to get from the beginning to the end. When he calls you to do something, he gives you enough faith to finish it. But you've got to keep your eyes on him and look to Jesus. Look to him who started your faith. 
Look to him who's going to finish your faith. Look to him that's going to perfect your faith. Look to him that's going to give to you the victory that you desire. Let the inspiration of his will activate your will and determine, make up your mind and be sure that you don't turn back, that you don't turn left, that you don't turn the right, but you follow the faith that focuses upon Jesus. Whoa. Jesus doesn't give us enough faith to get out of the boat and then sink. Because Jesus doesn't believe in that. The problem is, is that we don't walk in the faith that we started with. Now listen to this and I'm through. Galatians chapter three and verse three. That which was begun in the spirit cannot be perfected in the flesh. When you work in the spirit of God, the spirit of God teaches you a lot of things. The Spirit of God taught me how to preach. I didn't go to any cemetery, I mean seminary. Not because I was against them, it was my circumstances did not permit it. I didn't know anything. I wasn't smart. I didn't understand much about the Word of God, but the Holy Ghost taught me how to preach. Now then, if I were to backslide, then I could probably stand up here and preach you a pretty good sermon. How many preachers have we found out they were living in awful sin? And all the time they were living in awful sin, they were preaching and we were shouting. You see, there's a temptation on my part as a preacher that I'm comfortable with preaching now. I know how to do it now. And I can do it and rest assured in my past, I've tried that. It don't work out so good. I'd rather trust him. I'd rather let him preach through me. Woo, hallelujah. Oh yeah. I don't want to do this on my own. If I do it under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and you complain about it, I just say, well, go talk to him. He did it. But if I do it on my own, I got to take all those complaints and I don't want them. That which was begun in the spirit cannot be perfected in the flesh. The same is true of churches. We do so many things in the flesh. How many things, if the Spirit of God were removed from the church, how much could we continue to do and never miss him? That shocked me when I read that many years ago. And we need to take a look of it, at it. How much are we doing what we do in the flesh? Oh, we remember 
the times uh, when we depended on God and prayed and called out to God and needed the Spirit of God. Uh, but then after God blessed us, uh, we kind of sat back and relaxed uh, and began to ride uh, on the gravy train. Uh, and then we started doing in the flesh what the Spirit had taught us to do. But things that are begun in the Spirit cannot be perfected in the flesh. Uh, this church was begun in the Spirit. It cannot be perfected in the flesh. Let's get not, let's not be worried about getting in the flesh. Let's get concerned about getting out of the flesh and getting in the spirit because when you're in the spirit, the power of God is going to work. Hallelujah. I'm through. Take that. Hallelujah. I want to be led by the Spirit. I want to trust God. I want to depend on God. I don't want to trust myself. Are you with me on this? Amen. Amen. I want the Spirit of God to control my life. I want the Spirit of God to control the church. I want the Spirit of God to move at liberty when we assemble together. Amen. I want, I want faith to have in my life what is necessary for that faith to fully function. I want to respond to the will of God. And when he says come, if it's a revealed revelation to me personally, I want to come. I want to do whatever is necessary to fulfill his will for my personal life. As, as a body of Christ, whatever the word of God says, we want to do it. We want to do it. Would you stand together tonight? Thank you, my Father, that it's not by might, nor by power, but it's by your spirit. Thank you, Father, that we are a Holy Ghost people. That's our distinction, Lord. And we want to honor the presence of the Spirit of God. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We don't want to quench the Spirit. We want to make space for the Spirit. We want you to have preeminence, Holy Spirit. We want you to manifest yourself. Manifest yourself. Make yourself visible through the nine gifts of the Spirit in the assembled body of Christ. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel like praying specially tonight for those that feel a personal call. You're struggling with it. You may not understand it. You may not be sure, but there's a personal call. And you're not sure. Or maybe you're struggling in yielding to it but if that's you if there's anything concerning a personal call in your life that's troubling you tonight I want you to come forward and we're going to believe God to do something for you hallelujah in Jesus name in Jesus name hallelujah 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 thank you Lord Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, my brother.
Aleluia. I, part, I talked about a fresh anointing this morning. And I think God wants to do that. We're going to pray for my brother. He's been in the ministry for 30 years, but needs direction for his ministry. Needs to know how to fulfill and what to do. And we're going to pray for him. But come on to the front and let's come and let God give us a fresh anointing of his spirit. Hallelujah. God, I need a fresh anointing. I need an anointing that will adapt me for whatever circumstances that I'm in. I want that direction. I want that anointing. I want that understanding. In the name of Jesus, come on and cry out to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That he's working 